All right, I am now joined by Jonas Pontesen. He is professor of comparative politics at the University of Geneva and a leading researcher on Swedish social democracy. He's joining us today to give some context uh, around the recent Swedish election. Jonas, great to see you. Thanks for having me. So I think as you know, most people watching are well aware, uh, recently Sweden held an election and the far right party, Sw the Sweden Democrats, uh, made rather significant and somewhat surprising gains. Uh, I think people are probably also aware that, you know, the Sweden Democrats are, uh, they, they have sort of put forward anti-immigrant sentiments. They've been sort of sounding the alarm on crime. Uh, I think people probably also know that they have roots in uh, Swedish neo-Nazi uh the, the Swedish neo-Nazi right, uh, although, of course, in recent decades, in recent years, they've been trying to disavow that. So maybe just to uh, begin broadly, how exactly would you characterize the current political pl platform of the Sweden Democrats? And um, where from Sweden do they draw most of their support? So the Sweden Democrats are um, a right-wing populist party, as we call them, political mm -hmm. scientists. Uh, I I think, and as you said, they have, it is often said that that they have neo-Nazi roots that many other right-wing populist parties uh, do not. And it's, I suppose in that sense, maybe there is a comparison here with it, Italy and the brothers of, of Italy. That, um, though, as you also noted, I, I think the Sweden Democrats themselves would say, uh, We've been uh, getting rid of Nazis over the last 20 years and, and sort of adopting uh, anti-discrimination platforms and charters and, and sort of purging the, their ranks of, of the radical, of the very radical right. Um, and I don't know actually, or I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows exactly how 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 important those sort of fascist roots might be or might become. Um, they are also distinguished as being perhaps the most working class party mm -hmm. uh, in Sweden today. Certainly, if you look at members of parliament in the in the parliament that is now being replaced, uh, in which they had. Um, let me check here. Uh, they they had sixty two members of parliament, and and I believe that at least thirty, if not forty, of those members of parliament came from backgrounds that we would that we categorize as sort of manual workers or lower middle class or something, which is a very high percentage by. By Swedish standards, the Swedish Social Democrats are overwhelmingly university educated, the people who sit in the parliament these days. Um, so they have a, a, a kind of working class profile and and, and they have a, a kind of radical right past. And those two things have uh, are in some tension with each other. Um, they get a lot of votes and I can talk a little bit more about this from from working class voters, mm -hmm. uh, or that's certainly the category of voters in terms of if we look at Swedes usually divide the electorate into self-employed um, workers and then white collar employees with and without university education. And and uh, among workers, uh, the Sweden Democrats now are not haven't overtaken, but they run. They're running neck to neck with the Social Democrats, which is um, no other party has ever done that. Uh, so they appeal to, and they also, in contrast to the Social Democrats, appeal a lot to self-employed people. Mm. Uh, so they they do well among the self-employed, and they do well among workers, and they do very badly among university educated people. Surprise, surprise. I mean, this mm. is a story that we know. Right. Um, <laughs> I think that related to how well they're doing among workers is I think that among the European populist radical right parties these days, they are probably one of the most welfare chauvinist parties in the mm. sense that they are the, they pre present themselves as defenders of the welfare state. 
uh, they're also against immigration or they would like to impose restrictions on immigration, but they present themselves as defenders of the welfare state. In the last, uh, after the last election in 2018, there was discussion about whether or not they would form part of a um, right wing or right block government, coalition government, and those negotiations fell apart. And one of the Swedes refer to them as bourgeois parties, meaning non-left parties. And one of those parties decided to support the Social Democrats for the Social Democratic government instead. Interestingly, there was some debate about immigration, and there are numbers of value issues on which liberals and centrists consider this party to be maybe out of, or at least did consider it to be out of the mainstream. But one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks in, in those negotiations was that the that the Sweden Democrats wanted to increase the generosity of unemployment benefits, which mm. which had been uh, cut by the by previous governments, and that was in in some sense, I think, for the conservatives and the liberals, that was as big a problem as anything they had to say about gay marriage or something right. like that. Um, they have become, and and the entire Swedish debate has become very focused recently on um, on crime, mm -hmm. and 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 so they are anti-immigration, but 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 almost more so than being anti-immigration uh, in the in the campaign, they've been anti-crime and sort of tough on law and order, increase prison sentences. Uh, send home immigrants who 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 are found guilty of crimes, mm -hmm. but but it's become very much a a law order crime, and obviously um, and and strengthening the army, and clearly the the crisis in Ukraine or the war in Ukraine, in some sense, helped them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, I want to stay on that question because, uh, you know, especially what you say, given their sort of working class base, um, that's a very interesting question because I think, you know, at least here in the U.S., when you see working class voters sort of turn to right populist politicians or parties, uh, I think, and, you know, anti-immigration sentiment or, you know, fears about crime as well. I think often what underlies that is a growing sense of economic inequality, uh, you know, economic anxiety. Uh, we saw that obviously in 2016 in the U.S. with the election of Trump and, you know, a significant part of sort of blue collar voters in the Midwest turning to Trump after years of voting uh, for Democrats. And I, I, I want to ask you about this in the Swedish context, of course, because obviously, compared to the US, you know, we tend to think of Sweden as a very one of the most equal places on earth with a very generous social safety net and welfare state. And so I guess the question for you is, what kinds of longer term changes to Sweden's economy, and you know, the welfare state and trade union movements may have come before this moment that could have precipitated the rise or helped precipitate the rise of the Sweden Democrats? When we look at this specific election, the shift between the left and the right was tiny, tiny, mm. uh, less than a half percentage points. So we were already in a very tight situation right. in, in uh, 2018. Uh, as I said, the center party uh, chose to ally with the left or cho chose to become a supporter of the left rather than entering into a negotiation with the with the populists. That party lost badly in the election. This in this current election, the Liberals lost badly in the current election, and the Christian Democrats lost badly in the in the current election. If you look at the sort of original three left parties, they lost badly in two thousand six and in two thousand ten, mm -hmm. uh, and in two thousand fourteen. Mm -hmm. But in this election, they did. They actually their combined vote share. Uh, Social Democrats, left and Greens, actually increased. Mm -hmm. So, so, so in that sense, as you rightly say, what happened in this election has to do with kind of re 
a recomposition of the of the center right or the right block, a, a recomposition of the right block, and now a kind of symbolic acceptance of the populists that had. So, so the story is really about the Swedish right in the in this particular election, I think. Mm -hmm. um, going back to this picture we have of Sweden as uh, or yeah, lots of people have, I, and I, I sometimes share it, or in, and in any case, I profit from it since it gives me an opportunity to talk a lot. Um, so, when the Social Democrats were in power in between 1994, 2006, uh, they pursued a series of policies which, you know, in the European context, we often refer to as the third way. Uh, and those policies involved uh, reducing marginal income taxes on the rich. Uh, this was an agreement with the bourgeois parties. So a kind of reducing the... the, the um, progressive taxation, if you want to call it that, and capping overall taxation, um, putting lots of money into tertiary education uh, and trying to maintain public services and financing some of that uh, by reducing unemployment insurance compensation, uh, sick pay, and uh, social assistance and, and introducing, and you know, and th this was all done in the name of, um, you know, increasing people's employability, yeah. uh, social investment, investing in the chil in children instead of instead of spending on consumption, uh, spending on investment, and that this would generate a more equal society, in the, or that this would generate a more equal society in the long run. Um, if you look at the distribution of income among um, working age households, and I like to leave the elderly out, they, they have, it's a kind of special category. But if you look at the, the, if you look at the Gini coefficient, which is only one of many measures, of course, of inequality, but if you look at disposable household income, working age households, the Gini coefficient, which is, yeah, it, it ranges between zero and one. And if you are at one, then if you are, if the smaller the number is, the, the more equal the society is. I can talk about that if you want. But the Gini coefficient for disposable income increased by 37% from 1992 to 2018. Uh, so, so disposable income inequality has grown a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is striking is that in Sweden, this is somewhat different from a number of other countries, the Gini coefficient for market income, uh, that is to say, people's earnings, household earnings before taxes and transfers only increased by 13%. So more than half and nearly two thirds of the increase in inequality has happened through changes in the tax system mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the income transfer system. So, so it's really the welfare state that has been in some ways reconfigured and the social democrats were not the only people who did this uh there the the non-left parties were in power in the early 90s and again from 2006 to 2014 um, but the social democrats did not reverse what those bourgeois governments had done and in fact in many ways i think initiated changes that contributed this kind of retreat from redistribution. Mm -hmm. uh, and to go back to, to something you were hinting at when you were talking about uh, populist voters in the US and so on, I think I think a lot of a lot of Swedish working class voters kind of they they observe inequality. Mm -hmm. Their households are struggling 
much more, especially after the, or since 2008, their households are struggling in a way they were not. They are convinced with fairly good reason that um, mainstream parties of the left and the right are not going to do anything. They haven't okay. done anything for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, taxing the rich is not an option. And according to all of these parties, we have maxed out on overall taxation or overall public spending. Welfare chauvinism becomes a fairly rational way to try to deal with this problem from the point of view of quote unquote native Swedes and mm -hmm. also from the point of view of some immigrants who've been around for 20, 30 years or something like that. So now we're so the the re, the pie to be redistributed isn't going to grow. Mm -hmm. And now we're looking for some criteria whereby I and my household and my community can can improve their gain, get more from this pie and and you know saying that from the point of view of these people saying that people who have yet to become citizens or people who have lived here for less than 10 years, you know, maybe that's a fair criterion for deciding who gets unemployment benefits and who doesn't or who gets child care subsidies and who doesn't. So so in that sense, I think I think many of us political scientists kind of attribute the problems of the left to these cultural issues, mm. gay marriage, multiculturalism, all the woke things that the left is doing. Uh, and and in my opinion, there is a, there, I don't want to say that, that that isn't a problem in the eyes of working class voters, but I think the problem is very much about material grievances mm -hmm. and, and the fact that the left isn't uh, speaking to the, or hasn't spoken yeah, has kind of retreated from or taken a, a we are we are responsible for managing the economy and this comes first right. kind of uh, position. Yeah, yeah. I want to stay on that question because you had mentioned something very interesting, which is that the left actually did make gains this election, although, you know, obviously not to the extent that the Sweden Democrats did. So, uh, you know, you've talked about the sort of failure of the moderate or centrist parties, but I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why, you know, the left was not able to counter or stop the rise of the Sweden Democrats. Because like you say, you know, the warning signs, I think, have been here for quite some time. Right. Right. I think it brings us to two things. And you asked about unions earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 there is a big problem on that front. Um, we all we all or you all Americans, but many <laughs> Europeans too, looking at at Sweden, think of it as this very strong trade union movement with very high rates of unionization and so on. Um, what we fail to recognize often, I think, is that, in fact, there are three trade union movements in Sweden. Uh, there is a worker, blue collar set of trade unions, which don't organize white collar employees at all. Uh, and all of those unions are affiliated with this confederation, which is called ELO. Uh, and then there is white collar equivalents of ELO, sectoral unions organizing nurses and doctors in the in the public sector, uh, employees in, of private industry and so on. And then there is a third set of unions, which are professional unions, which organize only people with particular university degrees medical doctors, lawyers, engineers, what have you. The blue collar uh, LO unions or worker unions, they used to organize about 85% of the working class in this kind of blue collar sense of the word in 1994. And today they organize about 60%. So they've lost that just not only has that part of their population shrunk, but they but but union density in that group has declined uh, by 25 percentage points. The white collar unions and especially the professional unions have been growing, 
So, so there are so the kind of the upper union unions among the in the upper part of the Swedish labor force are doing very well and are continuing to do well. But the uh, blue collar unions are doing have been doing very badly and have become very preoccupied with uh, trying to retain their members. Uh, and as a result of that, I think they've distanced themselves from the social democrats hmm. uh, and they've kind of tried to or they tried to become less politically active they were and they still are um, affiliated with the social democratic party in some sense everybody who's a leader of one of these unions is a social democrat but partly because the social democrats have sort of gone their own way and become more white collar in their orientation uh, but also because of the populists threat and we can't sort of so the populist so among LO members in the last election or at least in a survey that was done in May among even among LO members the populists are nearly neck and neck with the social democrats uh and 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 this makes it hard for the unions to 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 mobilize strongly against the populist threat, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, I think. So there is, um, so the weakening of the blue collar unions is a, has kind of implied, and this again is a process that's been in the making for, for decades now, has sort of made it harder for the, the connection between the social democrats and, and sort of normal working class people it have have got those unions used to be the kind of crucial intermediary uh and and they are both much weaker than they were and much more defensive and in some sense trying to prevent membership losses by being more apolitical in a sense mm -hmm. um, so so unionization i think is is an important or or union losses in the blue collar ranks is an important uh, part of that story. Um, the other thing I was going to say, and again, this part of the problem resonates with with um, Trumpism and populism in many other countries. The most striking thing, if you look at the re election results and where did the populists do well? And badly. One thing that's very clear is that they do well. They do well among men, and much less well among women. Uh, and but the other thing is, they did badly in Stockholm, mm. uh, and they did not as badly, but but uh, quite badly in Gothenburg and Malmo. So there's three big cities, and in Stockholm, so they're their national vote share was 20.5%. And in Stockholm, their vote share was 10%. So they're, they're running at half their national vote share in the city of Stockholm. Uh, and they, and everywhere else they do well. Uh, so it is partly, and it's not so much the rural areas, the north of Sweden, which is probably the poorest remains, has always been a stronghold of the left uh, and of trade unions mm -hmm. uh, but in the southern third of the country small towns uh, they are really doing very very well and i think that to me is a is a problem for and here i mean it's easy to blame the social democrats but i think that left parties in general or the left in general, let's put it that way, has always had a problem dealing with regional inequalities. And regional inequalities in all, certainly in European countries, and even more so in the United States, have grown phenomenally. I mean, much, mm -hmm. of, the, much of the inequality that we've seen in the, in the last 20, 30 years has, been, has taken a spatial form, I think. Um, and... And to the extent that the left talks about inequality and and does anything about it, uh, it's about gender, it's about income, possibly class, or maybe it was about class once upon a time.
but but I think the left has a very hard time sort of thinking about and and proposing policies that that address regional regional issues. And if you look at regions and and how poor they are relative to, to the richest region in their country, this is a very good predictor of the populist vote share, basically. Uh, so that as as re- regions fall behind, populism thrives. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and actually, in the Swedish case, I think it's interesting because the the Sweden Democrats don't talk about this as an issue uh, because they're nationalists. So they talk about Swedes versus immigrants, or they mm-hmm. talk about crime, or they talk about Russia. So they are so they themselves are not they're not promising regional aid, but they are clearly tapping into material. Uh, grievances which are very much related to to regional development and and you know the city of Stockholm has grown phenomenally both in terms of housing and how many people live there but just in terms of economic growth and you know it's it's again a very similar story in the US and and I think if the if the left if if so, so if a, if a kind of social democratic reformist left is ever going to kind of roll back populist gains, I think being able to speak to this set of issues, yes. to put it very crudely, we are never going to regain the working class by, by, um, by criminalizing gay marriage. I mean, this is not an important issue to these people, right? Uh, in, in my opinion, I mean, it's, Right. It's it's just not. I mean, it, they may nod when somebody says that you know that 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 gay marriage is a problem, but it's not what they they're voting on, or it's not the core of, of what their what their issues are. Mm-hmm. And if, and if we want to address core concerns and and sort of pull the rug out from underneath the populace, then I think speaking to issues about regional development and and which can also be related to green transition and sort of alternative growth models or thinking of thinking in terms of um, something in which financial markets and metropolitan areas don't just drive everything. Right. So maybe then let's wrap up on the question of what possibly comes next. Um, of course, we don't really know at this point what's going to happen with the coalition government. Uh, but just on a very general level, what do you think these election results um, and you know a possible right wing coalition government could mean uh, not just for the future of Swedish politics, um, but also for the future of Sweden's social democracy. Because as you mentioned, you know, you, the Sweden Democrats are what you call welfare chauvinists. And I'm wondering how you think that's going to change uh, the, you know, safety net programs and the welfare state going forward. Yep. I don't mean to take up too much time, but I think we actually, I think we actually know exactly what will happen in the near future. Uh, there will be a a right government. Mm-hmm. It will almost certainly con- in that government there will almost certainly be two parties, the conservatives and the Christian Democrats. The liberals will be a support party outside the government. They will never vote, or they have said they will never vote for a government that has populists holding ministerial portfolios. Uh, so the liberals will not vote for the for populists in the government, and the populists will retaliate by not voting for liberals in the government. So we will end up with a two-party minority government, which draws on liberal and populist uh, votes in parliament. And in order for those pe- those two parties to support the government, they need to be given committee assignments and uh and um policy promises or policy concessions uh there was a vote today so i'm a little bit on swedish politics so the speaker of parliament was elected today it was thought that the populists would present a the candidate they chose not to present the candidate uh, the conservative 
who had been speaker already, remained speaker of the of the in in the parliament. The first vice chair is a social democrat. The second vice chair is a populist. And so committee assignments are going to be put around and the populists, at least now, are, you know, they're celebrating their victory. They are now in, they now have a, a speakership, second vice, but in any case, it's something they are going to get two committee chairs and two committee vice chairs or something like that. And, and they see this as, be now finally being recognized as part of the political system or something like that. Um, and a year from now, my guess is that they, so right now they're kind of playing game and being nice. Um, and a year from, and, and the question I think is how hard will they push or on policy issues over the next year? My guess is they are the biggest party on the right. Uh, they are, have been playing nice and I, and I'm guessing that they will insist on quite a few policy concessions. And, um, and there is at least a distinct possibility that the liberal party will then split and that uh, some group of liberal MPs, um, it would only take three of them would choose not, no longer to support this government and would, they, and therefore, it would open up, and this is what the Social Democrats are waiting for, a kind of liberal, centrist, social democratic, big coalition in the middle kind of thing. And I think my guess is that if I were betting, I would think that that's probably the most likely thing that will... Right. I don't think that this government... So I I think we know... Not exactly, but we know pretty well what the government will look like that mm -hmm. is formed in the next two weeks. Uh, I don't think that government will be around two years from now. Uh, and, 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 and in that sense, um, you, it's, it's possible that you that the answer to your question, what are the long term implications is, not very much will change actually uh and 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 um and the, and i think one question becomes sort of to what extent yeah so back up a little bit i'd say one scenario one scenario is that the government falls apart in less than two years uh the other scenario is the government persists and if the government persists the populists will probably lose because they will become implicated in a set of policy deals which they wouldn't have liked. So in some sense, from, an, from a kind of electoral mobilization point of view, the best thing that could happen to the Sweden Democrats is probably that the government falls apart uh, before the next election. If they have to go, if they have to enter the next election with as a government party, I think that will weaken them in a way. Um, my own sense is that public opinion, and this includes not only blue collar workers, but, but lots of educated, Swedes still are very supportive of welfare state provisions. Mm -hmm. in, in some sense, in some sense, on the one hand, nothing has been done to expand the welfare state or make it more redistributive. But on the other hand, uh, I think the things that have been done are probably, um, are probably as far as you can go, at least with regard to social insurance programs, pensions, unemployment insurance, and so on. Um, and and also in private services, we've seen a lot of kind of in public services, we've seen a lot of uh, privatization, outsourcing of mm -hmm. janitors and caretakers and things like that. It, it's it's not obvious to me that I think mo the more radical things that it's not obvious to me that a lot more can be done in that domain. And mm -hmm. the question then becomes. So it's really more in the domain of multiculturalism, 
language support for immigrants um, in the domain of crime and and so on, that perhaps we would see relatively big changes. Mm. My hunch is that none of those changes are going to address the material grievances of populist voters in some right. sense. Uh, and in fact, with respect to crime and so on, if if these changes would have any positive effects, you know, we wouldn't see them for another 10 years or something like that. So in, the, so in that sense, I don't think that these are, I don't, I, maybe symbolically the populace can claim credit for it, but I, but I don't think that these are things that are going to really change a lot. Uh, and so, so we're going to be muddling through uh, and, you know, and that maybe that's, is that a good thing or is that a, is that a is that a bad thing? But um, and to I, be continued. I, I keep, <laughs> yeah, and I keep hoping that the social democrats will, um, you know, move it. Will begin to rethink their economic policies, their redistributive policies. Uh, would begin to think more about what can we do to strengthen trade unions, uh, which which are have all been things that have just not been on their policy agenda. I think, yeah. um, and one one keeps hoping that, and maybe if they are in in opposition, and we do have a you know populist influenced. Uh, majority government, but the, their temptation is always to say we have to take responsibility, mm -hmm. right? That, that's been the social democratic thing in Sweden for the last 50 years. If there is a big crisis or big problems, Ukraine, whatever, we have, we are, even when we're in opposition, they are saying more or less explicitly, even when we're in opposition, we are the responsible party. Yeah. And um, there we are. All right. Again, Jonas Pontesen is a professor of comparative politics at the University of Geneva. Jonas, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thanks.